ओके सो वील स्टार्ट सो गुड मॉर्निंग शेरली एंड गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो टूडे इज अगेन अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट लेक्चर हाउ कैन वी इम्प्रूव क्वालिटी इन हेल्थ एंड हेल्थ केयर एंड शेरली हैज बिकम अ फेमस टीचर फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलरली दिस टॉपिक we all know shelly very well but for new joiners jo those who have joined recently uh, dr shelly is a hmm, md dnb uh, frcr clinical oncology from london uh, basically she is a radiation oncologist at uh, manipal comprehensive cancer center kasturba medical college she has also done fellowship in gi and lung oncology from princess margaret cancer center toronto Uh, she has also done global oncology leadership development fellow from toronto and again she has developed global health education initiative fellow from toronto she is a specialist in gastroenterology means she is she her area of interest are gastroenterology gastrointestinal and thoracic cancers and she leads the cancer quality initiative at kmc manipal very good her area of interest are stereotactic body radiotherapy artificial intelligence quality improvement and quality of life and symptom control she have, she has got almost 40 national and international publication peer reviewed so beside this i just want to say that whenever i have heard her dr shirley i have learned something so i request everyone that please listen carefully and it's a very very important topic which will give you some insight that how important the co- to improve the quality in healthcare segment it's a challenging task in these days but how can we do it dr shelly will explain you okay shelly go ahead please thank you madam for this kind introduction as well as the opportunity to present here to this august crowd i'm just going to share my screen It's visible, Doctor Shirley. Okay, just gonna put it in full screen. Okay, so the topic here that I'm presenting is on quality improvement in cancer care, and, and of course, that the basic tenets of quality improvement would be applicable to the entire healthcare as well. Now, we all in oncology or in healthcare overall always emphasize on evidence-based care, but often we feel that we are unable to implement the same level of evidence for every single patient by which the care or the outcome suffers so quality how you would define it is the degree to which you are able to achieve the desired health outcome and whatever care you deliver should be in consistency with the current professional knowledge So there are various tenets or various important um, uh, features of quality, and steep is the acronym or the mnemonic for this, which in terms means it can affect various various aspects like safety, timeliness, being effective, equity, efficient, and patient-centered care. Now there can be different levels of care, which can go from harm to the best level of care so this is a level five levels of care which shows you that the care which is possibly equal to standard or complies with standard but maybe some imperfections but anyways level 1 to 3 or possibly you are trying to improve more but more and more you see that there is harm or there is poor quality there is more risk for or harm that comes in for the patient could be intended and a lot of times unintended so poor quality could be a result of various factors it could be overuse of certain processes or activities or you do not know what are the facilities or the ability to make a process efficient so underuse or sometimes even misuse now why am i specifically talking about this in terms of cancer care this is already a dreaded disease there are various complex treatment aspects and a particular care in cancer for any particular cancer actually changes hands across the armamentarium so you you have to go through the surgical medical radiation palliative so it's a whole different set of hands and it's a totally different experience every time 
treatment. And there are so many treatments available as well as a high cost, which definitely adds to burden and financial cost. So quality is very important from the perspective of patient, so that every single patient receives the same level of care that he should be envisaged for. It's important for the physician as well, because as a physician, you need to be satisfied with what care you deliver, as well as it helps in financial gains and savings for the local health, that is the organization that you're working in. And ultimately, if you are consistently delivering a good level of care, the outcome measures or the level of uh, indicators or the survival outcomes or even the uh, toxicity levels at the national level may be much complying with evidence. So this has so many implications. Now, apart from just adhering to what happens in a hospital, of course, you know, there are a lot of different influences to patient care, to the socioeconomic access to funds, geographic location, and often these may have an overlaying uh, or work to do in terms of the quality perceived by the patients and family. But quality needs to be measured. Why? Because it helps you in the right decision making for the patient. You can see what are the exact outcomes, so you can see what are the drivers for success. The more you measure, the more there is the impetus to make it better because we never achieve a state where everything is the best. We are always improving and making it better. And of course, these kind of activities, particularly looking at quality, guide your policy decisions, systems, and finances. We are already hearing a lot about the choose wisely options because the resources are scarce. So we need to make sure that the quality is best and kept. And while adhering to quality, of course, could lead to a lot of financial savings too. So now question comes, which aspects of quality do we want to measure? Now this is called as the Donabian Square. You may want to measure something in the ongoing hospital, so it's the actual structure, not the actual building, but the processes or the flow in which the actual things happen. Or it could be the process, the way the patient navigates through your entire system. Or it could be in terms of particular disease-related outcomes. There are various indicators of quality which have come up or have been proposed by various organizations, particularly in cancer. This is across surgical, medical, and radiation. And these could be as one-point indicators of quality measures that have been put in. To give you an example, like for example, based on different sites, this is what NCCN has put in that patients should have should not have a particular marker or patient should have a particular marker tested for them every six months in acting colorectal cancer or the staging accuracy you you would want to make sure that every patient is staged with ct thorax after pelvis it could be in terms of patient experience every head and neck patient because you're a smoker has to have been given the option of smoking cessation it could be even to avoid a particular thing. For example, we do not want to perform pet scan in our cases. So you see here that when you put in these indicators, it helps you assess not just how you're doing over a period of time, but also whether there will be safe savings. So you may, may not be able to implement all, but this is what different guidelines have put in. And now, ASCO and different organizations have even the ability to accredit your center based on your adherence to these indicators. And these indicators, as we see that, you know, the continuous sense of quality improvement has also been centered by UICC. And if you look at their protocols, it talks about evidence-based protocols. It calls for a sense of continuous quality improvement. We have guidelines. And how best do we adapt these guidelines in clinical practice is what how a quality improvement process helps you. The other thing I was mentioning is accreditation. That is how the different centers which follow the different quality indicators or the quality processes can get accredited and be a champion for quality or safety in their local scenario. Let's get this slide. So here we come to quality improvement. So we understand that we have to measure quality and we understand that this is an ongoing process. So it has to be always made better. So what is this whole process of quality improvement? 
to further the improvement aims for better patient experience and outcomes. And it uses a very systematic method and various strategies by which you bring about these changes in the processes as well as in the people who are involved in delivering the care. And the quality improvement has various set of methods wherein it may be a team building process, coming together to identify a particular problem, measure that problem, and ultimately you will see that change on your patient face. Before we go into what are the steps in a quality improvement, I will bring this incident into consideration wherein this actually embedded the whole process of quality improvement in the NHS. So in between 2005 and 2009, in one of the trusts in UK, in Minnesota there was multiple series of incidents wherein patient care suffered. A lot of patients had very poor quality care delivered to them, a lot ended up with bed sores and falls in the hospital, resulting in increased mortality. Now, this resulted in a huge public outcry and inquiry, and there was actually a formal inquiry which was set up. So what does this tell you? This tells you that an incident or a particular lapse happening, it's not a something which is a sudden event. It indicates that it, by this very good model, that is a Swiss cheese model, that there are various holes in our system. It could be holes at the level of physician, holes at the level of multiple levels of care. As I said, we are transitioning, patient transitions to multiple layers of um, or handover of activities. So there could be holes or deficiencies. But a lapse may happen when all of these holes sometimes end up aligning together. And that results in a serious harm to the patient. So this inquiry, which was set up in relation to these Staffordshire incidents, that is the Don Bur Burwick finding, which is famously called, they said that they did not place the blame on anyone. What it said very, very clearly is that we, it called for a system which was devoted to continual learning and improvement, right, from the top to bottom, end to end. So where it pays the patient safety at the center of all. So it spoke of transparency, growth, learning. And that's why you see in the UK, quality improvement is something which is very much embedded in the curriculum. And even the residents, staff, everyone is called upon to do quality improvement projects. The Institute of Health Improvement also puts in the no needless list, wherein it calls, says that there should not be any waste, there should not be any endless suffering, don't be left out. Again, emphasizing a lot on these no's which should come in in our quality. We see that often this is what happens, that there may be some trigger, something goes bad, and then a series of events takes place. Dr. What Shelley, can I intervene? Yes, tell me. Yeah, there are comments. It says that the voice is not very clear and there is some echo. Oh, is it? Yeah. Um, Can you be closer to the mic and little yes, more loud? Yes. Yeah. Is this better now? It's better now. Okay. So I would say that quality improvement shouldn't wait for a particular incident to happen. It's all about learning some new skills and implementing those skills together as a team, wherever you are in the clinical system. Who does this impact on? Is it for me? Is it for you? It impacts on all, we know that. It will definitely impact the patient whose experience navigating through the entire system is gonna be better, their outcomes are gonna be better. It's gonna impact the family, also the organization and the physicians together. So who should be part of your team as a quality improvement team? You have to build in your team as in the people who are all involved in the delivery of care. So a doctor is not the only person that needs to be there. It's a doctor and I would say even lay patient members can be part of a QI team. Nurses, allied health professionals, admin support, extremely important to have a buy-in from the admin, not just from the local admin, but from the management as well, because that sets the goal or the tempo, because a lot of administrative or 
uh, implementing changes may be required or which you require approvals. And at the same time, you can showcase your work to the entire team. And of course, if your projects involve community or community team as well. A lot of skills which will be required or skills which will be gained during a quality improvement process. And I would say that, you know, you begin with enthusiasm, optimism, curiosity. You also end up learning a lot of perseverance and how to build relationships amongst the team. And of course, we learn from one another. The quality improvement is not a new thing. It came in from the Lean Sigma, which is a concept which was built or brought about by the manufacturing process in Toyota. Essentially, in manufacturing processes, they looked at what are the ways so that they could make the manufacturing process more efficient. Now, the learnings that came from this actually do very well apply to healthcare and have expanded on or led on to various quality improvement methodologies. What we I can talk about today is about an A3 method methodology. It's nothing but a 11 by 7 inch uh, kind of sheet, which is, gives you a broad preamble on which you work on through a quality improvement. This is how a quality improvement sheet looks like. Not just tells you what actually you did, but also helps you show your progress throughout. And this is our quality improvement work, which we did at KMC Manipal, where I will work through this example where we worked on mucositis related pain. And we'll show you how we ran this process at our institution. The basic parts of it would be that you set a goal. You say that what exactly you wish to achieve. So basically, you have to have a topic. You have to have a background work as to what is your pain point in your particular institution. This is the current work that we are doing at our institution as a part of the quality hub, where we are looking at what are the cases which are discussed in our tumor board. And basically, we feel that the cases are not discussed despite there were multiple tumor boards being there. And we set a goal as to how many cases should be discussed. So our baseline was around like 40% and we wish to make it up to 90%. And while you have a goal, there may be many various things that you want to start to measure. And these are the kind of measures that come in, process measure, outcome measure, and balancing measure. Process measures are the ones which we take along what happens during the actual goal or which helps you reach the goal. Outcome measure is your actual goal. And we also want to look at other things that are happening. I again emphasize the building process. So again, it's a group of individuals who are continuously deliberating, thinking, being creative, coming out with various ideas. There are various thought provoking steps here. We want to identify ways in our system. As you see here, it's a process map. We want to identify how our exact system works. We identify what are the ways there. We look at what may be the root cause for that particular problem happening, which are again classified into various headings. And we think deeper. This is a two by two matrix where we look in at various problems or various causes that we came in, and we do not try to solve everything, which is not possible. So here there's the thing that 80% could be achieved by maybe only 20% of the problems being solved. And once you identify those things, you can set them up as the actual interventions or the changes that you want to bring about. This is again an example, and I will go through in the further examples in the relevant topic. So ultimately, this whole thing is actually a problem-solving tool. You do this again and again. You, small, you bring about small changes. You do the PDSA cycle. That is a plan, do, check, or plan, do, study, act. And check whether what you want to do works or not. So one may say, well, isn't QI, research, audit, isn't these all the same? Could be same. I mean, they all talk about a particular relevant clinical question. All of them involve data collection. All of them do involve dissemination of your findings. So you're presenting your findings like how I am presenting my findings today. And we all wish to improve the health service. Be it research, be it audit, we want to see where we are. But how is QI different? I would say that research actually generates new evidence. So there is lacking evidence. There isn't one way to do things. You may want to do ways differently. Research helps you get that. Audit helps you see 
how you comply to that particular evidence. So it's a lot of statistical way to see how you are adhering to that evidence. But quality improvement would be how you would implement evidence efficiently and methodologically. So basically, you're seeing you're not generating any new evidence, but at the same time, you're seeing how you're going to implement them in a routine way and the best way possible to do it. So you're not testing any hypothesis, but you're focusing on various systems and processes which helps you achieve that evidence-based care. Different kinds of quality improvement projects can be done, which could tackle our basic tenets of quality, which we spoke of, like effectiveness. It could be focusing on smoking cessation. It could be on the of course, pain management. It could be whether you adhere to all of those quality indicators that I spoke of. Or it could be talk of referral policies in community. It could be in terms of, you know, smoking or the various um, screening measures that are available. It could be primarily patient-centric. So it could be based on distress, the various complications, or how you make the decision, how you make sure the patient understands that decision, even like bereavement services. It could be timeliness. That is, you're looking at time from diagnosis to treatment. You want to get that well. Could be safety, so you want to reduce mortality, you want to reduce the risk of infection, or it could be efficiency. I'm giving you the various examples to see you how all of these various different topics also end up addressing different aspects of quality. So it's a broad umbrella, well organized into each of these. Again, give you some examples. This is similar where we look at staging accuracies and how we want to improve staging accuracies. Another example, so wait time between the chemotherapy, so where they want to reduce the amount of time spent in the outpatient facility. Documentation of pain management, how they went about improving documented pain management. And here I would like to bring to you a clip, which is the, as a part of the National Cancer Grid, a quality improvement program, which is enable quality improvement patient care. It's a QI hub set at the national level. There are many cohorts that have come in right from 2017, and we are ongoing with our 2022. And the various centers have gained from being part of this project and have gone on to develop hubs in their own centers. Now I would like to shift the gear to our problem that we spoke of. So I will speak to you about the mucositis related QI, pro, uh, QI um, process, which we set up at our institution. We thought that pain is a very important uh, dreaded symptom that happens during the hygienic treatment, particularly radiotherapy treatment. But this has implication because it leads to weight loss, infections, and end up patients reporting pain. There have been practices which have shown that these metanic cancer patients have severe pain and definitely there is a need for stronger medications for these. Are we able to always prescribe the best? It has been seen that there is lack of access to opioids, there's poor pain relief, and there's even poor prescribing. There are a lot of barriers to these aspects that we have thought of. So our main problem was that in our head and eye cancer patients who are receiving concurrent tumor radiation, acute mucositis was a problem relating to weight loss, poor quality of life, poor compliance. And we think that this definitely impacts the control and survival. When we did our background work, we saw that the documentation of pain was in only 56%, with about 84% having moderate to severe pain. We have a very well-developed pain and targeting medicine services, but we saw that the utilization of this service, which is readily available for pain management, was only 23%. So we came together as a team, and this is our team with Dr. Priyanka, Umesh, Kritika, who are from the radiation and palliative care teams. They were ably supported by our head of the departments of radiation and palliative medicine. You can see our mentors here, Dr. Nandini Walat, Dr. Arjun Gupta, Dr. Sidney. So we were ably supported in our QI journey by both national and international mentors. It's a very enjoyable experience where we learned about the entire QI journey. And our problem statement, as I told you, that acute mucositis rated pain was not adequately addressed. And we wanted to address the pain in head and neck cancer patients. So we made it very specific. We wanted to make sure that the self-rated pain more than four 
should be reduced from 70% to 20%. You, I told you that we did a background audit. We saw that about 70 to 80% of them had severe pain as rated by self-rated pain by patients. And we started our journey wanting to reduce it down to 20%. So we set up various measures. You cannot achieve the goal without having to measure a lot of processes and as well as various measures which we set for the process, the outcome and the balancing measure. So we looked at what percentage of pain scores were documented, what percentage of palliative medicine referrals were made for patients with more than four. Our main outcome measure, which I already stated, but we also saw, wanted to see whether this whole process would cause any burden to our team, the entire team. The next step we went about doing was to see how our patient interacts with the system, as in how a patient who is planned for radiation and who is receiving radiation goes through the various steps in the process and how is pain assessed for these patients and how do we, how are we currently assessing them for pain and how are we generating a palliative care effort. This is without doing any intervention, without any preconceived ideas. We just looked. We only, this we call a Gemba work, wherein we looked at the entire process end to end as in being part of the system. The next step was, as I told you, we identified waste. So I said that there could be overuse, underuse, I mean, many issues happening. So we did notice that there are a lot of waste. There could be multiple registrations happening. There was a distance issue. We were poor documentation. There was no availability of the treating physicians at times. There were no actual manuals or even pain assessment tools. And we were not utilizing the doctors or the nurses as well for even assessment of basic vital sign like pain. Then we sat together as a team to identify why this could be happening. Remember, it's a thing to see and learn together. No blaming, no pointing. It's about us together as a team identifying what's going wrong. And when we thought about it, we came out with so many different issues or causes that could be impacting this pain. It could be right from personnel, it could be methods, it could be the environment in which we run in within our outpatient department, the distance, the materials that we had or did not have. And we even thought deeper for certain things. Like for example, we thought that, you know, this documentation of pain isn't happening. Why isn't happening? And we did end up thinking that, you know, sometimes people think that pain is a expected side effect that you're bound to endure. And you come up with these detailed thought process by thinking more and more about those costs. Next step we came about is the same causes we wanted to be as a team came up with these methods because you cannot end up thinking or, you know, dealing with all of these. The effort cannot be for all. So we wanted to look at what could be the ones which give us the highest benefit and which are really easy to do as well. And this is a Pareto wherein we look at what are the factors. So there may be only few factors which actually end up impacting or causing 80% of the issue. And then we came across with these key driver and interventions. So these are the various headings that we wanted to work on. That is SOP for pain assessment management, educate our, because we said lack of education was the main thing. There was no proper process for reviewing how the patients would be reviewed during treatment. And we wanted to integrate various personnel into the treatment. Let me start with one of the interventions that we began with. Before our electronic system came into being, this was the earliest thing that we put in, that we put as a part of our vital stamp pain score to be part, wherein the nurse would measure it even before the doctor would see it. This is the second thing, that's a pain measurement chart, which came into our radiotherapy card, which give to the patient. And you see here, for all the days, we have the patient documenting their self-rated pain on a daily basis. through a lot of things. The third thing was to bring about a brochure. We brought about patient education brochure. You see here, wherein we gave a full information booklet to the patient and we did this in Canada in the normal language here, native language here. 
and as a part of the education for head and neck cancer patients about their diet, pain control and pain management very much was a part of it. We developed or set up various education methods and a proper SOP of how pain management would happen within the radiation oncology department and where we would call on and intervene with the help of the palliative medicine specialist. There were proper triggers which were set in for involvement of the palliative care uh, physicians. We also developed a worksheet which was when, which went into a radiotherapy chart wherein every day a radiotherapist had to document the pain and there was the OPD nurse which would actually generate the SOS calls. We were not able to actually generate SOS calls at this time, but we were able to set up the RTPs nursery and they were able to send the patients directly to the OPD if in case of pain was more. Training sessions are being conducted on a regular basis, not just for the radiation oncology and the residents, but also for the technologies, the nurse and the LINAC nurse. So this is our whole system, which I showed you the process map. But as you see here overlaid are the various works that we put in within that process to make it more efficient and make it more better. So what happened? So this is at the beginning. In the early part of our journey where we started, you can see some waxing and waning here. Slowly things started to change. The levels started to dip from 70 to almost like 50 percent. Then you see here there were the various interventions that we brought about and which brought the pain scores down. Some helped to bring it down significantly. Again, there were some changes. We brought in some more intervention. And finally, we were able to see the fruit of the intervention process where we could see that we had achieved our target. Was 20 the watershed line? We don't know. I mean, we were happy that we were able to achieve as well as sustain at 20, but we had made up in our mind that maybe less than 30 was a good enough thing. So what happened to the other processes apart from our goal? You see here that the pain score documented went on from 55% to 100%. What, how did it impact our team? Our team rated that their burden did not increase much. They rated their burden to be between one to two. So this is the last part where we talk of how we implemented this. So this is not a one man show. This is a team. So for all the things that we brought about, there are different people who make sure that these things are running. And there are different people who, whom we report to who are the overall in charge for this. So what was our learning through this QI system? So through this entire QI journey, it brought about capacity building amongst the radiation oncologists with help of the palliative medicine team. We were able to develop a very good SOP for pain management within the department. We know how well to integrate palliative medicine in the curative phase of the head and neck cancer. And this has brought about a major process change in our department. And with the support of our team, it's still ongoing. And we are still measuring our change and we are achieving our change. And our participation as a part of the quality improvement uh, journey enabled us to set up a quality improvement hub. I'm very happy that we are, it's been a year since we have a hub. We are about a team of eight members who are from the various parts of the uh, cancer team, surgical, medical, radiation, we even have a management person who is from the quality or the operations team from the management part. And we are currently working on a quality improvement project which impacts the whole cancer center, which is working on the tumor board uh, participation rates. So the QI is a teamwork. It will lead to success, it will impact the patient. And I would say it's one of the very satisfying journey for anyone who is involved in this process. So quality improvement begins with love and vision. It is the love of your patients and of course the love of your own work. And if you begin with a technique that is only with technique, you won't achieve it. It has to come with the various tenets. It has to come in not just the process, but your involvement together with the other right goal. So here I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirley. It was such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think people must have 
really understood that how important and how easy and how difficult <coughs> basically it is not very difficult you will just have to make a team and you have to just set a goal and start working on this and you have beautifully said that how they can work so now we can take any questions if they have I do see here Dr. Nandini here, and I'm very happy to take some comments from her. She's been my mentor through that quality improvement journey. Okay, anyone has good any morning? Questions? Good morning, Shelly. It was so nice to hear you speak on this project, and you know, it's also kind of you have like you know very often the palliative care clinicians uh, struggle to uh, bring in the concept of uh, quality of life into the um, cancer uh, uh, treatment uh, teams. And you have shown uh, how it may be done in a you know, collaborative way through consensus formation and not like you know, blame game. I think that's what quality improvement does. It, it creates a lot of you know, healthy relationships and oh, you are finding this difficult to do. Let us hear about it and let's see how we can change that. So every person, the receptionist, the liftman, the technologist, the nurse, everyone has the ownership and they feel, you know, and uh, definitely when we present it back to them, they feel so honored that they have been part of uh, the patient's uh, difficult journey and, you know, been able to improve something. So, uh, um, uh, like, you know, many people, uh, many um, PG programs include research as, as well as audit. Now that, you know, Sushma is here and so many of the head of the departments are here. I'm just um, putting up a thought that, you know, can quality improvement uh, following an audit, could it be part of the three-year PG program? Somewhere in the middle year, they could probably do this in, in relationship with another uh, you know, um, department, so that there is uh, final benefit is felt by the institution, and of course, it will add to their uh, uh, CV, etc. So, um, the best part for a mentor is to see, you know, the mentee flourishing into a leadership role, and I'm so happy to see that uh, Shirley and so many others have, you know, started their own hubs. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nandini. I think it's wonderfully said. I think we at our own department are looking into this wherein we want to uh, develop the small QI um, workflow for our residents. It's not just for their learning, but uh, it helps them achieve their mandated possible publications too for this process. Yeah, and it leaves them with a capacity forever. They, wherever they go after their graduation, they have to you know, lead the palliative care program in the institutions and they are left with a, you know, they are given a capacity that, you know, they can make changes into the existing structure. So, and I, I think many of the MD and DNB program institutions have already completed the, you know, QI project through the Equip India and um, please consider that as a possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Nandini. Any anyone wants to ask anything from Dr. Shelley? No questions. Any comments besides Dr. Nandini has said anyone wants to say anything? I can see so many senior people. Dr. Raju, you want to say something? Dr. Raju from AIMS. Hey, good morning, ma'am. Uh, uh, yeah, very, very excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Shirley, and uh, very nice. Uh, yeah, definitely a very needed aspect in in every, I mean, every center, not even uh, this one. So I think we need to uh, embrace such kind of uh, methodologies uh, uh, to bring the quality improvement definitely in every aspects of the things. So other than that, I think uh, I don't have much, but we're also trying to uh, educate the uh, not only the tertiary care centers, but again, the primary health care centers also, uh, wherever they provide any treatment, uh, starting from the uh, diagnosis and the referral also, this quality improvement needs to be happened. So checking back uh, whether the patients are being properly referred uh, back, uh, ref follow, uh, referral up and both referral down as well. So I think uh, uh, it, it applies in all the aspects uh, uh, beyond the palliative care and, and the cancer treatment as well. That's the comment on have. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Raju. Dr. Reena, are you do you want to say something? Dr. Reena George? Uh, um, no, Dr. Shma, actually, I had a phone call and I just joined in now. So, uh, but the little bit that I heard was very inspirational. And thank you for making this a part of, you know, palliative care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reena. Thanks a lot. Uh, Vidya and Shobha. Vidya, I can see you and Dr. Shobha. Good morning, madam. Thank you so much. Uh, it was actually so good to hear Shirley and then Nandini because 2017 when we started QI, you were there, Nandini was there who initiated the whole process and then we went through so many centers and what we learned was uh, one thing was methodology, how we go step by step and not jump steps. So I think it's very important that all MD students do this as part of their project because it is very, very helpful. And we were told, and fi the final result was, you know, get, get better at getting better. That was one thing we learned to work with teams and get better at getting better. And even the uh, Cardiff uh, MSc thesis, especially during the time of COVID, many of them have done QI projects as part of their thesis. So it's, it's a very, very, you can take any aspect and uh, work on the quality improvement. And now that we are so many hubs, we are also one of the hubs. So, and uh, now anesthesia department is doing a project. It helps in bonding and integration because when we all work together, it is multiple departments. It actually helps in true integration of palliative care. So thank you so much, Shirley, for that class and madam for this uh, you know, session that you are having through IAPC. And Nandini, a huge shout out to you because bringing it here in 2017 was, I think, one of the best things you did for palliative care. Thank you so much, madam. Shobha, thank you, Vidya. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank good morning. You. Thank, you. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation, Dr. Shirley. Um, like Nandini said, um, uh, I think it would be a good idea for second years to take this up uh, for the postgraduates. And uh, we've been... I've been trying to, in between on and off, trying to get into the QI project. Sometimes uh, personal constraints and, you know, a manpower was a problem. So I think we'll get into the nitty gritty of this and it's very useful. Unknowingly, we do a lot of things, but if it's structured, uh, then it becomes easier and there is some output and outcome to show. So I think that's important to have a framework um, to work towards excellence, but otherwise we are doing random things to improve patient care and uh, which we are not able to audit uh, like Nandini said. So I think that would be a good idea to sort of, you know, have this um, as a small audit program uh, for the postgraduates. Um, I think I'm very open to discuss this. Thank you. I can see Dr. Menachi. Do you want to say something? Dr. Menachi from Adhya. Uh, Ma'am, I, I just put in a question. Actually, I wanted to know, like in oncology, various disciplines of oncology, there is a, a established uh, benchmarks for clinical care. Um, so uh, do we have something already existing in palliative care? I'm not aware of it, I'm very new to it. So I wanted to know if there are already established benchmarks in palliative care for, you know, uh, newer centers to follow because that will, uh, you know, start off a uh, sense of uh, standard of care uh, at the beginning itself. And that Shelly, is do you want to answer? Shelly, would you like to answer this? Yeah, yeah. So basically, even in, in part of the ASCO, they have certain indicators which are related to symptom management and supportive care. Some may apply to palliative care, like, you know, documentation of pain. Uh, some of them related to the number of patients going to the ICU, the quality of death aspects. But I think I have seen recently many publications, maybe if other experts, palliative care experts can shed their light about designated, but there are various palliative care indicators in different domains like physical, social, psychological, you know, from the distress domain, spiritual domains, where they have come up with a lot of indicators. And I don't know which is an which are the established indicators which are um, validated and to be used in uh, care. But I'm sure that there are many indicators which have been put forward. 
Um, Sushma, can I also I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so one um, Lancet publication uh, exists, which is talking about the early integration and they clearly, you know, recommend certain uh, like eight weeks into the diagnosis and, you know, so many other recommendations, which is, I think, published in 2017, I think. Uh, then the other one is, of course, choose, choosing wisely India. They have come out with 10 low value and harmful practices which need to be avoided. This is also published in the Lancet in 2019. And the very first uh, low value uh, thing which needs to be altered is that, you know, palliative care uh, referral has to be uh, done early. And I think the sixth one is not to have, inter you know, ICU shifting of a patient without any reversible. So even in the 10 uh, low value mentions of the Choosing Wisely India, um, it is there, and of course, you can refer to the Lancet publication as integration. So, thanks. A lot of work, like on um, um, even the NCP or National Consensus Project of the Quality Palliative Care in the US, which they have come up with almost like 150 or 180 indicators uh, for different domains. So, one may have to look into it and possibly, you know, even look at what should be the national indicators for palliative care in India. Maybe as IPC could come out with them. Actually, actually, I spoke, I mean, once I had a conversation with the NABH team and, you know, I was wondering whether we can have NABH uh, include uh, some quality standards also, because we already have an audit standards document from IAPC. If they could use that, that could be one way. Um, so to... I, I, I think Nandani, Dr. Anjum has done this work. And this is uh, about to get published. Anju Maroon, Dr. Adhgopal, we have given this work when Dr. Marian was president. So they were working on the quality standard of any palliative care center in the country. That's right. So if that could enter into the NABH, uh, you know, now they have a two things, pain policy, end of life care policy. And these are left as uh, just documents in the NABH accreditation when they check. But, you know, the person who was asking about are there guidelines, you could start off with these. They must, I'm sure your hospital is NABH accredited and they've already there is a pain policy and end of life care policy document. You can start activating it. And what I'm saying, Sushma, is to IAPC uh, as an official, you are, I'm telling you that using the audit standards that Anjum, Dr. Raj Gopal and all worked on, can we make it enter into the NABH accreditation also? We can use that document. And, you know, make that as standard requirements for, say, comprehensive cancer. This is in the process. This is in the process, Nandini. Let's the document get published first. And then we will be doing this. So, Excellent. meantime, I think, meantime, I think two important things, which the, all the audience can do wherever they are working, that their hospital should be pain-free and they should have end-of-life care policy. I think these two things, immediately they can start. And when, once you will start these two, with the help of what Nandani and uh, Dr. Shirley has explained that everything has to be systematic. There are many hospitals working a lot. Many people are doing a lot of things, but uh, most of the things are not systematic. Most of the things are not uh, having any accountability and proper documentation. Uh, so methods, they have explained it well. We can work on these methods and we can continue to have a good uh, um, hospital basically it was in basically a healthcare improvement of health and once the improvement of health will it's not that it is we are improving patient care we will improve there, there there are three aspects which will improve that patient care will improve even the staff morale will improve and even the hospital infrastructure and uh, uh, hospital will also be benefited by improving uh, standard of care so Shirley, Nandini, Vidya, Shobha, everyone, Minakshi, thank you very much for giving your comments. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, uh, in these days, everyone, at least uh, most of the hospitals, they've started talking about, uh, about uh, quality improvement program. Uh, so it is very good habit that doing uh, your uh, monthly audit or uh, quarter, uh, three monthly audit or 15 day every 15 days audit and then work on that what is going wrong what is not going wrong what is going best what what works what does not work so i think 
uh, Shirley has given good good insight to everyone, and hope that uh, this program will become take up, and uh, we will be able to include in the postgraduate program as well as in various hospitals. So thank you, Shirley, and thank you, Nandini. Thank you, everyone. I just want to inform Ishma. that next week. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, this is the last one in this series. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you just to make okay. sure. Thank you. So this is just a uh, just to inform that uh, uh, next week is Diwali, so we will not have lecture next week, and this is last lecture of series five. Uh, next lecture will start on October thirty first, so you have a break for one week. So there is no need to get up at six thirty next week Monday. You can just sleep because it's a Diwali holiday also. And uh, next, uh, now we will start on thirty first of uh, October. And in, on thirty first October, there is a very new new topic that is focus that how ultrasound can be beneficial in palliative care settings. So most of the hospitals, uh, institutional based hospital, they have a bedside or a portable ultrasound, and how it can be a boon in palliative care settings. This will be the first lecture, and uh, please join uh, on thirty first October. Before six thirty, so that we can start in time. And thank you, Shirley, Nandini, Nisha, Archana, and uh, everyone those who have joined and commented. Thanks a lot. Have a good week and happy Diwali. Thank you.